This episode of the Dungeon Cast is brought to you by Heretic's Guide to Devotion and Divinity, live now on Kickstarter. Most of the time, the divine feels like little more than an afterthought in 5e, too easily forgotten or ignored. Where are the sacred oaths that aren't just lame excuses for the paladin to act all righteous? The fearsome celestials that the heroes will actually have a chance to fight? The cool rituals, the interesting cults, holy organizations, and divine agents? Get all of that and more in Heretic's Guide to Devotion and Divinity, a new 5e sourcebook that will bless your game with ready-to-play relic hunts, ceremonies, sacred oaths, divine NPCs, religious cults, cool celestial foes, divinely inspired magic items, and much more. Heretic's Guide to Devotion and Divinity is live now on Kickstarter. The PDF is only 25 USD, and as part of the Kickstarter, you'll get all of the digital assets. That's creature tokens, adventure maps, handouts, etc. A bunch of stretch goals have already been unlocked, meaning all backers will also get divine feats so players can be champions of the gods or perform minor miracles, cheat sheets for DMs to track all the new NPCs, cults, gods, and more, an all new divine dragon with stats for all life stages, sacred subclasses for cleric, paladin, rogue, bard, ranger, and warlock, exalted encounters to drop into any campaign to give your game a touch of the divine. Be sure to check out Heretic's Guide to Devotion and Divinity, live on Kickstarter now. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm William. This is a podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons. And today we are covering Mephistopheles. Hey Brian. Hey Will. How you doing today? I'm good, man. How it's are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. Your cough is better. My cough is better. <laughs> okay, I am, good. I, I, I might cough once or twice, but no more than that. I guarantee <laughs> Spicy it. Spicy coughs. This episode is so chonky. It is a very chonky and long and thick episode. Thick. Yeah, it's the thickest episode I might have ever put together. Yeah, we're if you've listened to our other Devils episodes before, there's lots of good juicy lore. Indeed, uh, Lots yeah, of there, good drama. Lots so of drama. And I'm that, ready for some more. Yes, there's plenty in this. So how many arch do of hell do we have left to cover besides this, this one? This is the last one, man. This is it? Asmodeus already got his own episode. Yeah. Which was a good episode. I, I re- like revisiting that episode every once in a while. But um, but yeah, this is the last one. Go check out our <laughs> Asmo episode. It's older, um, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that doesn't mean that this is going to be the last Fiendish episode. We saw, I'm going to fit as many of those as I can in before the end of the year. Um, yeah, but yeah, this are. is the last Archduke. Cool. And, you know, with all the spooky stuff that we've covered, uh, that we covered in October and the new Patreon vote, voted episodes and the one D&D uh, Unearthed Arcanas that we've been having to cover, I almost actually forgot that it was Year of the Fiend. But it's Year of the Fiend. It's Year of the Fiend. It's Year of the Fiend. It's our friends are back and they're here to stay <laughs> for at least a while. Indeed. I wonder what we're going to do for some of the like. We have like the shout out to Demogorgon stuff peppered throughout the podcast. We do. We do. And shout out to Demogorgon. That's Year of the Fiend stuff. It know. is. It I is. I don't know if that's going to continue. I mean, it has to continue. People love it. People love it. And also, our Lord and Savior loves it and would be uh, irate with us if we stopped. Wait, who? Uh, Demogorgon. Oh, yeah. Shout well, I mean, like, it's more of a subliminal vibe that they want to give off a lot oh, of Oh, okay. So. so you think we're a little too high key. We got to bring it down. Not during Year of the Fiend. Okay. Maybe, maybe during not Year uh, of the Fiend. Like, we shall see. <laughs> if you're if you're on the visual side of things, we have we have a little bit of subliminal <clears throat> Demogorgon stuff going on all the time. So today is a big Fiend episode. Maybe the biggest Fiend episode of the year. Definitely um, the thickest. Definitely the thickest. Uh, a Fiend, I am sure, many of our listeners have been waiting for with bated breath. The Vegeta to Asmodeus's Goku, the Sasuke to the Lord of the Nine's Naruto, the Batman to the Lord of Nessus's Superman. <laughs> We're talking about Mephistopheles. I, I have I have one complaint. Okay, with, go ahead. With, uh, yeah, it was stop. very yeah, go good, ahead. by yeah, the way. You. But yeah. <laughs> Batman to the Superman. You know, I I there's a question mark there. That, there is, there is, and uh, it's because I mean, who else? His Joker, but like that's more, that's not a rivalry. No, that's the thing. It's it's it's, it's the rivalry that that I'm I'm trying to key into here. Yeah, that's that's true. That's uh, I'm just gonna asterisk question mark like you have already done in the notes. The Batman Superman. Okay, thing. if if someone in the comments has a better example of who Batman's rival is, please let us know. Uh, but we're talking about Mephistopheles today. Oh no, uh, wait, are you saying Batman is the is the better one or Superman? What are you saying here? Uh, the you know, Batman. I, <laughs> you, the, you wrote this like Batman is Mephistopheles. I did, and, and that Superman is a superior superhero. I, I mean, Batman says it himself. Basically, it he said it many times. In fact, okay, we're doing this now. Um, <laughs> Sorry, we're gonna talk about Batman. Batman for a little has bit. said many, many times across many different comics and cartoons. If Superman ever comes comes for him, like, and really means it, and is like. You know, bloodlusted, like not gonna stop, not gonna hold back. There's absolutely nothing Batman could do. Like 
all his contingencies will fail. Everything that he, he, he has planned will not hold up. Nothing can stop Superman if he really goes bad. That's true. He yeah. has and more. he has literally said that across many comics. Uh, he has so, yeah. more plot armor than any other, like, you know, yeah. drawn, written character <laughs> sure. maybe ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe. Even but we're talking know. about Mephistopheles yes, today. Yes, let's talk about Mephistopheles. Okay. Thank, the you, second, thank you. For, the sec- I, I, I'm glad the air is clear about <laughs> Batman and Superman, though. The second most powerful archdevil in all the nine hells, also known as the Lord of No Mercy, the Lord of Hellfire, the Cold Lord. Mephistopheles is not only the Lord of the Eighth Layer of Beator Cania, but is also Hell's greatest wizard. This dude has a lot going on, and none of it is pleasant, so let's get into it. I wonder if his AC is kind of low. Um, his AC is super low. And we're going to get into that. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Mephistopheles is a proud devil and a straightforward one at that. Thus, he plays up his infernal image as much as possible, intentionally appearing as a classic archetype of diabolical devil. He is nine feet or 2.7 meters tall and striking his handsome visage and charming yet unnerving smile of self-superiority contrasted by his more monstrous features. His fiendish claws, bright crimson red skin, large bat-like wings and impressive curling ram's horn all leave his hell heritage on proud display his eyes are dead white and pupilless his hair is long straight and black the lord of hellfire is no is also noted to constantly uh, don a dramatic flowing cape as dark as the deepest void that's awesome he's like that's super epic. he loves being a devil <laughs> he's super into it <laughs> nobody dresses as good as me yeah except for you asmo but the rest of you suck yeah Look at my cape basically <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, he also has a secondary look. Uh, some claim is his original form. This form has a strong reflection and connection to his hellish realm of Cania, a wasteland so cold it makes Stygia or er, Stygia. You did it right. Stygia. You got it the first time. Yeah. Stygia seem warm by comparison. You, you remember how cold Stygia was, right? Yes. It's very warm cold. by comparison to Cania. I got you. Okay. okay. Uh, in this form, Mephistopheles has blue black skin across his heavily muscled body, wings, horns, and claws that are all deep shade of blue. His scales are a sooty black and his eyes are pale blue, save for the red irises and pupils within. So his more monstrous looking form is this original, quote unquote, original form. This theoretical original form. If I were a betting man, I should have looked at to this, I would bet that's his 4E form because 4E oh, always likes to do things differently. That's fair. <laughs> if it is, it was making me think like this is the this is the skin he got imported into the game with, and then he went into the custom creator and like or that it could gave be that. himself a fucking cape. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I would do. <laughs> Finally, for a time, Mephistopheles had an alter ego, a false identity. We will go over later in the episode known as Molokroth. As Molokroth, the Lord of the Eighth, appeared as an obese man with gross levels of fatness uh, that were frankly absurd and uh, just uh, uh, fantastical. Okay. Uh, despite being seven feet in height. Or 2.1 meters. <laughs> he was still whiter than he is tall. Oh. Or, yeah. Absolutely <laughs> surpassing even creatures like hill giants in terms of sheer mass and gluttony. Gotcha. Uh, even when the waddling baron was swar- swathed in clothes made from only the most ridiculously expensive materials that were the height of fashion styles, all his foppish finery couldn't hide his ultimately ludicrous appearance. Still, this was for a very brief time in Mephistopheles' rule, and it served a very specific and diabolical purpose that we will cover in a bit. Okay, okay. So Mephistopheles is a bizarre and somewhat fascinating archfiend, as in many ways he is a walking contradiction. On the surface, the cool and calculating cold lord, and beneath that, the grandiose and hot-headed lord of hellfire. I see, he's putting on a front always. Yes. Uh, He is a being of razor-sharp instinct, careful suspicion, and prodigious brilliance. A cunning genius with an unparalleled understanding of hell's political dangers, and a great capacity for patience patient deception. Foremost wizard of Beator, his ordinary speech is like a whispering wind and his cool, pleasant demeanor gives him the outward appearance of a princely gentleman. He is both sophisticated and charming when he speaks, an intellectual force of understated wit, reason, and self-restraint. However, this is by no means his ordinary or private behavior, but a facade which disguises his true personality, a veneer of elegance as carefully crafted as his traditional infernal appearance. I want to hear more about Mephistopheles. Let's get into it. I want to know more. Yeah. Despite his courteous persona, Mephistopheles is a highly unstable individual on the inside. The contrast between his cold surface and fiery core, a perfect example of his existence as a walking contradiction. Mephistopheles is a vicious being with an outrageous temper who, when alone in his palace, frequently flies into violent rages, his quick wit burning away when met with his underlying hatred and frustration. In his shrieking fits of terrible wrath, he can even go as far as tearing at his own skin and destroying his surroundings in an explosive outburst of fiery magical destruction. His unpredictable eruptions of rage having been his undoing multiple times in the past. 
Although his convincing intelligence is certainly real, or his conniving intelligence is certainly real, Mesopheles is at his core an emotional entity that is ultimately driven by his passions. So this guy is just chilling, thinking about the world. Yeah. And he's just like drop kicks his tube TV. Like, yeah, like drop absolutely. Kicks a hole through I mean, his flat screen. He, he strikes me as a very Dr. Juggle, Mr. Hyde kind of guy, right? Sure. He Where just pops he's, off. He's super intelligent. He's sophisticated. He's got all, he's a gentleman. He's all these things, but he's got that inner beast that just breaks free and he goes full Hulk mode. Right. All the time. I was going to say, we're, yeah. you know, in the modern 21st century age, we should say Bruce Banner and the Hulk, because that's, I think, a, a, a more solid touchstone. I I guess so. Uh, I, I just, the, the Dr. Jekyll part, it just feels very like, I'm sophisticated and blah, 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 blah. Well, I thought Dr. Jekyll was the bad guy. No, Mr. no, Hyde's Mr. Hyde's the bad, Hyde's the bad. Well, okay. they're both bad guys. Right. But, but anyways. Yeah, Bruce Banner's not. Well, I don't know. He, no, Bruce Banner's not a bad depends guy. Depends on what storyline. I guess I haven't really seen one where he's a, a, a bad guy. Yeah, he, he's a questionable guy in a lot of them, right? Uh, not to my knowledge, but I'm not that familiar with Hulk stories. So. World World War Hulk. He's, he's like, not present in World War Hulk. It's uh, all Hulk. I think he is, kind of. I'm pretty sure because it might be a different in World War Hulk. Mm -hmm. He comes back to get vengeance on the Illuminati for sending him out in space in the first place. Yes. And And Bruce Banner's like way back there and killing his family because he married somebody and the nuke, a nuke went off that was planted by Reed Richards. It's a whole thing. Right. So he comes back and he just fucks them all up. But he never isn't the Hulk. And it's actually Bruce Banner that comes out that tells uh, the Sentry, this, "You have to stop me because if I if I can't stop him anymore, if you don't stop me, like I will break the world." And then the Sentry yeah. takes him out. You know, he's I've, sentry. I've seen some stuff with all of the Hulk's like kids because mm-hmm. the Hulk ends up having like a bunch of rogue children. Yeah, um, and Bruce Banner's like involved with them. Like mm-hmm. he comes out as oh, like a ghost. That's interesting. Or like a pro- a projection. Oh, that's shit. interesting. Okay. So uh, that's what I was thinking of right now. And I was like, is this World War Hulk? I haven't no. actually read World War Hulk. But no, like, I don't think that's World War Hulk. Yeah. All right. Back to Mephistopheles. All right. To add to this, Mephistopheles is an obsessive entity who suffers no distractions from his focus, his studious pursuits being of utmost importance to him. The Lord of the Eighth has a deep hatred of any unwanted distractions or rarely gives his time to anything not worth his personal attention. He's known to go as far as disintegrating underlings for the slightest annoyance, only allowing a few select devils to speak to him without being spoken to first, and even executing his servitors just based on the mere suspicion that they might bother him. Yeah, that's that. That's crazy. Awesome, actually. He's He's vaporizing fools for no, almost no (laughs) apparent reason. reason. Yeah. Further cementing him as a contradictory entity, though, is the strong but flickering nature of his focus and obsession. Mephistopheles' great intelligence often mixes with his obsessiveness, as in his pursuit of knowledge. As in his pursuit of knowledge, he becomes fascinated with the most minor details. Though this allows him to delve deeper into topics than most, but the greatest mortal wizards, his unrelenting focus is inevitably tempered by his responsibilities as an archduke and is ultimately undermined by his mercurial behavior. Yeah. I- wouldn't it be crazy to work for this dude? Oh, like, I would. That would be a nightmare. You gotta, like, is there a trusted? Are we gonna get into like some trusted servants? Of we his? are actually. So we he are. won't vaporize them. He's yeah. gonna vaporize. There's like, a few select. Yeah, some minions that are trying to like climb the ranks. Is like, I'm gonna impress the boss today. Mm-hmm. And he Bad idea. Like, Don't do hey, it. Hey, boss, I got you lunch from the cat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's dead. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that would suck. <laughs> when forced by some political circumstance to stop what he is doing, there's a chance upon returning that some new project will have caught his eye, at which point that research becomes his new top, top priority. Because of this cycle of undivided attention followed by casual neglect, Mephistopheles has had many useful discoveries on the brink of being access that he never brings to fruition. Which okay. is probably great for the cosmos, because trust me, this dude is into, like, the deep magics. This dude is trying to, like, unravel reality and become a god. Like, Yeah, he's, yeah. he's into he's into some yeah. fucking crazy shit. But, yes. So he, he, so basically he's, he leans he, in really he'll hard. He'll be hyper-focused, yeah. but then something will force him to, to look away. And then on his way back, like, five things distract him. He never gets back to that thing that he was hyper-focused on. Uh, he's like, man, I was about to unravel the cosmos, but then I had to take out the garbage. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So while his anger and neurotic tendencies are without a doubt weaknesses, he is able to either hide them for the most part or use them to his advantage. The truth is Mephistopheles' most damaging issues are his rampantly unchecked megalomania and recklessness in pursuit of power. Okay, so no matter what he's up to, he's just trying to... I don't know. He's already he seems really strong already. Oh, yes. Yes. So he's just trying to get more strong. Uh, One of his biggest focuses is trying to become a god. Yeah. So, I mean, he has to do all this 
uh, under the eye of Asmo. Right? Yes, as just like friend, everybody. Not just under the eye of Asmo, but like his realm is the realm next door. <laughs> and we're going to get into that because him and Asmo have a very strange relationship. You'll see. He's like doing <clears> quiet <throat> experiments in his house. Well, that's the thing about Mephistopheles. Wake up Asmo. He's not yes. quite, Mephistopheles is not quiet about anything he does. He literally is like, I'm going to take over one of these days, motherfucker. <laughs> and Asmo's like, you keep saying that. And if you weren't so valuable, I would do something about it. But you're very valuable. So keep doing you, bro. I'm going to be God. You'll see. <laughs> yeah, and Asmo's like, get back to work. Yeah, basically. Basically. <laughs> Uh, though he uh, though he'd hate to be compared to Beelzebul, uh, both archdevils are incapable of being content and compulsively overextend themselves. Beelzebul's plans collapsing under the weight of his unrealistic expectations, and Mephistopheles becoming so absorbed in his plans that he ignores his overall well-being and often any form of subterfuge or subtlety, executing his wicked plots in extreme and dramatic fashion. I see. Okay, there his it is. brazen ambition almost glorious in its utter utter nakedness. So Asma was like coming over, like shutting shit. down down like constantly or what um no not really sometimes sometimes i think as a lot of times actually i think asmo is subtly causing failures over in mephistopheles neighborhood just because he's like oh that's a little dangerous i'm gonna stop that yeah but for the most part he just lets mephistopheles do what he's doing and lets the politics of it all and mephistopheles is on uh, inability to like see outside his his tunnel vision be his downfall yeah he's like exhausted himself into like a project or whatever exactly he can't yeah. Like yeah handle the walls crashing down around him when mm. the time comes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mephistopheles is in many ways the most entitled of all arch devils an avatar of envy who resents the fact that he is merely the second most powerful arch devil always jealous of others he can never get enough prestige ever wondering where ever wondering where his awards are when another is rewarded for service despite the fact that he continually, confidently, and directly tells Asmodeus he plans to take his throne away. <laughs> so he's just like, why won't you reward me? Because like, you're a jackass. That's why. <laughs> I worked. I'm the best worker you have. It's like, you're going to stay there. You're going to stay right there. You're too valuable to promote. Right. And if you get promoted, you get promoted to me. Exactly. The exactly. man in charge. Exactly. <laughs> so Mephistopheles rarely, if ever, bothers to cloak his intent with fake vows of obedience, truly believing that he is the rightful ruler of hell, that his destiny is to rule it, and that he deserves to be worshipped as a god. He constantly demonstrates his attitude anew each day and likely wouldn't be satisfied even if we achieve this primary reason for existence he believes to be true. And, and you're saying Asmodeus... Uh, like, he tolerates this. He tolerates this because of the good work that Mephistopheles does and that the uh, fact that he's like can always put him in check yeah so uh, we're we'll get a little bit m- into it later but like there's a few reasons one is what you just said two is the fact that like Mephistopheles is so straightforward that I, I bet you, I bet you it's it's fucking refreshing to Asmodeus. It's like, I don't have to like, <laughs> we're not playing these words. fucking yeah, we're games. Playing games. I like, just know, I know what he wants. He knows what I want. We don't like each other, but we work together while the rest of you motherfuckers are like constantly trying to like out politicize me, out maneuver me, out uh, whatever me. Like this dude's a straight shooter. Like it's easy to deal with. <laughs> They're having a beer. He's like, I fucking hate you, boss. He's, yeah. he's like, I hate you too, And the Meph. thing is they would have a beer because like Mephistopheles is pretty much the only arch devil that will literally just be honest with Esmo about whatever's going on or, or even give him advice and be like, uh, what are you doing boss? Because X, Y, Z is happening. And you know, if you let that happen, it's going to mean ABC. And Esmo will be like, you know what? You're right. And then we'll go take care of it. That's He's, actually kind of cool. Yeah. Like Mephistopheles' that. thing is like, yeah, I'm going to take over, but I'm going to take over because I'm going to take over. Not because you're going to make a mistake with, with that dude over there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's a weird relationship. It's like, I'd be the best if you weren't the best. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So before we move on, we need to talk about Hellfire. Uh, I thought you were going to say what Mephistopheles' like nickname that Asmo gives him is, because I'm more interested in that. Well, right if you come up with anything, let me know. Well, uh, I'll think about it during the long rest. Okay. Uh, you mean short rest? Yes, <laughs> okay. that's what I meant. So before we move on, we do need to talk about Hellfire. Okay, let's um, talk about Hellfire. Which is not only one of my favorite songs from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Have you ever heard that song? It's a great song. Which one is that? Is that the go, one where they're- fire, Hellfire. You know, yeah, yeah, Basically, yeah. he wants Elsmer Elda, but he, and he's blaming her right. for his 
God, what a- issues. Like, oh, that movie great is, kids song, guys. That movie is so fucking problematic <laughs> yeah. and awesome. And, yeah, like weird at the same. I time. I love Hellfire, but it's not that. It's not just one of the best Disney songs ever, but also an incredibly powerful arcane force that is imperative to Mephistopheles' story, power, and goals. And is different from fire that exists in hell. Yes. 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 A, a good distinction to make, I would mm-hmm. say. Indeed. Hellfire is both a type of energy and magical substance that Mephistopheles invented slash discovered in his endless arcane experiments in pursuit for more power. A corrupt and extremely potent energy with the properties of flame, Hellfire is unimaginably hot and created by tapping into and mastering the profane essence of hell itself and channeling it into a usable form of power. Okay. Mephistopheles himself, uh, through his experiments and training, has become so entwined with the stuff that if he did not take uh, measures to constantly repress it, his body would emanate dark flames, causing anyone who touched him or even approached him to be scorched by the unholy energy. It's a fucking Amaterasu. Yeah, Holy it shit. really is. He is the Sasuke to the... I'm telling you. This is the. <laughs> this is like the energy of the lawful evil in the plane. Yes. That's oh, exactly what it is. Yes. yes. That suggests it's, it's that cool. this type of energy exists in every plane in some form or fashion. Not that it's hellfire. It would be uh, it would manifest itself as something else. I like else. that. Yeah. And I, you know what? I haven't read anything that like led me to to know what those things are, but I bet you they, they should exist. There's probably not a lot of people like Mephistopheles running around trying exactly. to fucking trying to tap extract that. that shit out of the right. plane. Exactly. Wow. This is awesome. This is, yeah. I love, he's my favorite archdevil. Besides Asmo. Uh, <laughs> besides Asmo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get reckoned. So uh, <laughs> now, uh, now we're going to move on to Mephistopheles' realm of Cania, but Hellfire will come up repeatedly from here on end. Okay. Uh, Mephistopheles' realm is the gloomy, frigid wasteland of Cania. Uh, a realm of cold, indescribable with uh, a realm of cold, indescribable with words so bitter that it is practically alive. Oh. Cania outmatches even the Arctic Sea of Stygia in sheer harshness. The cold hearted frost more like that of the plane of ice with the temperature in most areas being below negative 60 Fahrenheit. Uh, or negative 51 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Without magical protection, the merciless chill will quickly kill most life in hours, if not minutes, if not seconds, depending on how prepared they are. I don't think we've ever done a temperature one before. No. Well, no, I don't think we have. Uh, The icy hellscape suffers from violent snowstorms seemingly brought on by Mephistopheles himself. The blinding, howling wind spraying ice and dust that stings at best and tears flesh from the bone at worst. Uh, (laughs) Filling the wild frozen expanse are jagged cyclopean mountains and colossal glaciers that emanate a dim blue white light, the only natural source of illumination in the entire layer. The glaciers endlessly grind against and crash into the mountains with speeds enough to cause avalanches consisting of several thousand tons of snow and icy rock. Uh, Death in Cania is swiftly followed by freezing, which encases the corpses in clear coffins of ice, preserving their expressions of anguish even thousands of years after demise. The cold thing is so fucking crazy to me. Why? It's just like it's hell, right? But then Mm -hmm. there's like these two spots in hell that are fucking cold as shit. And yeah, well, I mean, it is more hot than cold, right? So we have uh, Avernus, very hot. Yes. Uh, we have the Iron City Disc, so hot, you you can't walk there because the metal is just constantly glowing. So hot. Um, <laughs> but then then we go to Mineros, which is not hot. It's just a nasty swamp. And then we go to... Fuck, so warm. I would, ah, Swamps human. are warm. Yeah, yeah, they can be, but they can be cold too. Oh, cold swamp. Yeah. Despacho. Yeah. <laughs> I think next up is Phlegethos. Super hot there. Super Might be hot. the hottest one. Yeah. Um, after that is Stygia, which is cold. Cold. Then Ice we, cold. Then we Melodomini or Melodomini or however you said it that one time that I can't remember. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yes. That one is just, it's just nasty. It's not hot or cold. It's just polluted. <laughs> it's 74 degrees. It's actually, <laughs> it would be incredibly pleasant if it didn't fucking reek. I, and that's kind of the idea of Melodomini is because before Beelzebub ruined it all, it was gorgeous. Right. Um, okay. And then, then we have Canada, which is cold, coldest. And then Nessus, I believe, is hot again. So hot again. Yeah. Uh. Okay. <laughs> so you're right. It, it it does stand out, but it 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 doesn't stand out. It's like half of the hells are hot, half the hells are cold. And are half? Am I right to say that like half of these hells are also trying to come to life? Like have this like semblance of this living sort of? Because like one of them is a fucking body. Yeah, that's true. Although that's changing, but um, uh, yeah, okay. it's not that unusual because we talk about a lot about this when we talk about the abyss. How the abyss—it's the environment itself—is evil and changing mm-hmm. and almost mm-hmm. sentient in some ways. It, 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 I think it would uh, track that the nine hells is similar in a way. Yeah, like a lot of these layers are like sound like they're trying to like 
do a either thing. cling to life or like come to life somehow. Yeah, I I think there, there's a little bit of that going on because we talk about like uh, Phlegethos, how like there's fire in Phlegethos that like purposely will will burn or not burn devils. Like it almost has a sentience to it or a purpose. Right. So that was standing. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. Despite these conditions, yeah. some small amount of life has been able to carve out a hungry existence in Cania. Uh, the icy caves, hidden mountain valleys, and deep crevasses serving as decent hiding places from the harshest weather. Fiendish dire polar bears and wolves are said to prowl the land, having evolved effective immunity to the bitter cold. And supposedly, remorazes and glacier worms of great rarity are also present. Yeah, I, I always think about the remoraz in, yeah. in situations like this. Glacier worms, though? What's that? Yeah, I don't know. We don't got a stat block for it, but it sounds cool. It's a worm. I, I, I'm picturing purple worm, but it's blue, in and it glacier. likes the cold. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So a blue worm, a glacier worm. Yeah. Uh, and then there's just polar bears and wolves. Dire also. polar bears. Dire polar bears. Yes, large polar bears and wolves. Yeah, as matter of fact, it, was it just dire, or was it dire fiendish polar bears? Let me see. Fiendish uh, dire polar fiendish bears. Fiendish dire polar bears. So fiendish dire polar Yeah, that's it. That's you scary. It. Got it. That was standing Kenya is a... A layer so cold that even many devils find it inhospitable. Only the aptly named ice devils, the primary residents here, and second in authority only to the pit fiends, can comfortably exist in Cania. You know, if you're traveling through the layers, like in a linear way to mm -hmm. get to Nessus, yeah. then like having to jump between fire and ice kind of seems like a hurdle that a lot of, like you just said, mm -hmm. they can't get to Nessus because they can't get through Cania. Yeah. That's cool. And, and it's a, it's that, like that also measure. tracks, too, because we have literally the hottest layer right before Stygia, mm -hmm. one of the coldest layers. And then we jump right back into what should be pleasant, but it's probably actually very hot after you've been in Stygia and Malodomini. Mm -hmm. And then, bam, the coldest one. So it's like a, a switch back and forth, back and forth. And now, OK, now you're in Nessus. Yeah, Good especially job. if you're not prepared. Like, yeah. we know all this from the outside looking in, but, like, adventurers don't know what no, to expect. exactly. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, Cania is, in effect, a giant laboratory testing ground for the experiments of Mephistopheles and his scientists, where immense quanti immense quantities of organic energy can be released into the waste without concert. He's basically blowing up nukes out there and seeing what happens. Yeah, like ocean <laughs> bomb testing. Yeah, exactly. The testing of new spells, magic items, and other supernatural techniques regularly causes local devastation. And the libraries and data storage areas of the plane are spread out enough so that one unexpected cataclysm doesn't accidentally destroy other research. There's like one fiendish dire polar bear that like keeps narrowly escaping all these fucking hazardous things they're doing. Yeah. It's like, I've seen it all, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's like telling a remoraz about all the shit he's been through. I like how they're sentient. I like that. That's great. <laughs> Insight could be made regarding the nature of the research by simply observing from a distance. <laughs> and renowned archmages such as Mordenkainen are known to visit the horrible tundra looking for lost lore or information to help them in their own endeavors. As a result of Mephistopheles' unwavering or wavering attention, supervising sages and spellcasters with incredible research can be found in long forgotten citadels as buried in ice and snow as they are in bureaucracy. Wow, that's cool. That's cool loot, man. Yeah, exactly. Some fucking spell scrolls from this mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you don't know what they're going to do. You don't know. Even the uninhabited cities of Kenya house many secrets, buried deep under the ice and only visible as distorted shapes, but when unearthed, they are both prosaic and alien in architecture. Long before Asmodeus ever descended to the Nine Hells, Kania was a realm of grand cities. The remnants of that ancient power now preserved in ice in the form of strange spined monstrosities battling devas and archons, as well as their works, the icy tombs, lost libraries, and palaces now haunted by ghosts and terrible undead. Yeah. The original denizens of these cities remain unknown, and most devils would sooner leave the ruins alone than disturb them, regardless of the shelter they provide from the horrid environment of Cania. Perhaps it is this legacy of ancient power that compelled Mephistopheles to make his home in Cania, as it is. it was said that it was in these tomes that Mephistopheles learned of Hellfire and obtained weapons powerful enough to give even Asmodeus pause. So wait, where are these books coming from? Did you say that? Before? Okay, so there are two things. Yeah, I know it's a little confusing. So um, number one, he's got a billion of these like bunker labs, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and temples, and, essentially. Yeah, like, and some yeah. of these are, and they're below the ice. Mm -hmm. um, but because he gets in, super into uh, research and then distracted, there's a lot of them that he's just forgotten about. Like oh, There's I literally see. like devil wizards and stuff out there that are just like, 
twiddling their thumbs, kind of like we are with YouTube right now, just waiting for the news <laughs> to do something like, when am I going to get paid? When are we going to move forward with the project? And they're just forgotten about. Yeah. Just like YouTube has done with so us. So our AdSense account is one of these, exactly. these science bunkers yes. under the and ice. And we live in Cania, where it's just so cold and we're so forgotten. <laughs> we're just trying to eat, man. Just pay us. Uh, <laughs> um, so that that's one thing. The other thing I'm talking about here is there are ancient cities that were here before the devils um and like some of them have been dug up and like in the glaciers you we see that these frozen alien aberrant monstrosities fighting angels and the devils are just like i don't know when this happened this must have been a long fucking time ago yeah let's not fuck with it so what what is the explanation for that lore is this like 4e stuff again or is this no like this a- would be so you actually you see this with a lot of the nine hells some of these nine hells are actual like full-on uh, material plane worlds like Stygia, th- right? like Stygia that got, yeah. got pulled in right um in the case of Cania, it seems like can't the the deeper you go into the nine hells the more like um the closer to the plane of of existence of Beator you get to mm-hmm. um so I think Cania and Nessus have, have just been here so long probably before the dawn war right um and whatever these angels were fighting wherever these angels whoever they answered to uh, whatever these things are that they're fighting, all that shit is just long gone and no one knows. It's before anything that is current. It, it's time immemorial. Okay. Yeah. So if we were to spitball, it could be like Far Realm stuff. Could be. And the angels are trying to like beat it back. And could like be. Establish totally. a ground. Okay. I'm Absolutely. just trying to make sense of, of it somehow. Yeah. The idea here is that it's incredibly mysterious and it's so old and ancient. Even the devils don't fucking know what it is. Uh, and as a DM, you can come in and make up your own shit and, and have it fit right in. Cool. Uh, so Mephistopheles' primary base of operations in Cania, and perhaps the only notable area of the entire plane, is the Citadel of Iron and Ice, Mephistar, which is a cool fucking name, by the way. Mephistar. Yeah. Mephistar is carved from the sparkling ice of the glacier it overlooks, the tremendous mountain of ice of ice Nargis. Mountain of Ice Nargis, yeah. The tremendous mountain of ice Nargis, Nargis. which can be controlled by Mephistopheles to move where he wishes, cool. crushing crushing any lesser glaciers in its path. <laughs> <laughs> the city is a gleaming, translucent, blue-white jewel of ice perched at the glacier's edge, though several misinformed poets quip about how Kenya is as cold as Mephistopheles' heart. They aren't completely wrong about his home mirroring him. Just as uh, the Lord of No Mercy's cold exterior masks fiery passion. So does Kenya's cold mask, the oddly warm and inviting nature of Mephistar. I think all I, all glaciers in Kenya are like mid-sized sedans, and Nargis is like a semi-truck. Yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't that be funny if yeah. it beeps when he backs up, too? Yeah, yeah, I love it. So even before his hellfire experiments, Mephistar had lavish heated baths and scented fires. When And when the huge doors of the walled citadel were open, massive steam clouds poured out. It is from within this fortress city that Mephistopheles holds court over Ice Devil Legion as well as Spine Devils and Horn Devil staff, all ceaselessly following strict scheduled activities. The Citadel's levels seem endless, but the three topmost terraces house thousands of safe and cozy living quarters vaulted impossibly upwards. The bottommost levels being cramped and worn like the topmost residences being grand suites. Wow. And it is within the higher regions of Mephistar that Mephistopheles' true palatial manor is placed, a castle where all furnishing and contents, even his throne, are constructed of subtly and intricately detailed ice. However, Mephistopheles' experiments in Hellfire have been proving detrimental to the overall stability of his domain. The foggy cloud around the city has grown thicker and more established. The details of his estate have become more muted as as they thaw and puddle. Uh, the ice devils, once perfectly fine in the somewhat warm citadel, have begun leaving for the outer reaches of the plain, replaced by increasing numbers of pit fiends, horn devils, and bearded devils. He's climate changing his own fucking yep. lair. Yep, that's exactly what's happening. Oh, shit. The Garden of Frost, uh, once a perfect facsimile of an organic garden in Mephistar, and one of the few beautiful, if saddening, places in hell, has to be repeatedly blasted with cones of cold to keep it together. Oh. <laughs> From the 99-story School of Hellfire, elsewhere in Mephistar, pour toxic clouds of effluvia that leaves a portion of the citadel uninhabitable for non-devil inhabitants. Eerie bursts of Hellfire have become signature characteristics of Cania, and the inherent risk of meth- 
Uh, Mephisto, that's another, that's a short name for him. Mephisto's hellfire strategy grows obvious even atop the Cold Lord's slowly melting throne. Damn it. You threw one, you threw the nickname in here at the end. I you shorned it right before the short rest. What's up, break. Mephisto? What's up, Asmo? And I came up, Mephi- oh, that's good, but Mephi- like Mephisto from. Marvel Comics. Yeah, which is based off awesome. of Mephistopheles from, I think Mephistopheles is from uh, uh, the Faust, the tale about Dr. Faust. Are you familiar with that tale? It's a really mm-hmm. old story about a doctor, I think, who wishes for immortality. So he signs a contract with a devil and he summons a devil named Mephistopheles who takes oh, his shit. soul. It's a whole thing. Okay. That's, um, that sounds interesting because I, yeah. I came up with, before the short rest, I'm proud of myself, Papa Staffa. Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. Sweet of short rest. Let's take one. Yeah. <laughs> Papa Staffa. I like it. Shout out to Demon Gong Shout out to, shout out to, shout out to Demon Gong Gong. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Demon Gong Gong. Shout out to, shout out to, shout out to Demon Gong Gong. Oh, yeah. We've returned. Indeed, we have. We are back in hell. <laughs> yeah, we are. It sucks. <laughs> but I love it. It's rad, though. It's super cool. Hey, but I would not actually want to be here. <laughs> I was I was looking at our analytics, <clears throat> and I mm-hmm. saw that uh, a huge, por- the biggest portion of our fan base in the States is in Chicago, specifically. So I wanted to shout out everybody in Chicago. Thank yeah, shout out Chicago. Um, we are going to be in, we are going to be at PAX this year. Um, at least we have plans to be we at PAX this year. We have plans to be at PAX this year, yeah. yeah. So, um, would love to see all of you. If you guys could tell somebody about the show out there, we yeah. would love to grow the audience in the, in that area and a few other areas where we notice like we've got clusters of folks. Um, listening so thanks everybody out there uh it's kind of funny because my wife's from originally from like she that area is. she has a yeah, bunch of family in chicago it's like <clears throat> yeah. do, I, do i resonate with the people <laughs> in the midwest yeah you Chicago's might the midwest right like, uh like, yeah definitely i yeah, think yeah. it would be yeah absolutely um Sorry. Or maybe it's not, and then we just fucked up. What but. I think it is. Sorry about your hockey team. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks are a real shit show of an organization. <laughs> Sorry um, about your baseball teams too. Oh, also that, yeah. Um, and anybody close to Philadelphia. God, that that sucked. Yeah. Uh, but also back to D and D. Also funny. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, thank. Uh, well, be- hang on. Uh, yes, thank you. Guys. Thank you, everyone. In Chicago. We want to. We want to grow the fan base there. So um, spread the word. Spread, spread the word about the show. Tell somebody about the show. Um, we w- we would love to have more listeners from that area. So yeah, thank you guys so much for for listening. If you guys, if anybody out there listening wants to support us, please do so at uh, thedungeoncast.com slash or no, sorry, patreon.com slash thedungeoncast. Mm-hmm. Thedungeoncast.com is a website that we have. It is. We you can, can find go all there. Our projects there. Indeed, you can. Um, but yeah, let's get back to it. All right. So. With his Ice Devil's growing discontent, his capital threatening to melt beneath him, uh, and Mephistopheles' attempt at growing his cult using Hellfire, putting him into large amounts of divine energy debt to some of the other archdevils, particularly Despater and Levistus, Mephistopheles is taking a serious gamble. For though his success could ideally grant him the largest and most popular cult, failure will leave him devastated and his investors will likely sabotage him if his risks seem to likely to pay off i would say that you have a pretty solid backer in asmo though for like oh, oh if you're gonna take the thing risks. is asmo's not really helping him no it's just uh well he's taking a big risk in that like if his debt comes due to dispater and levistus it's gonna start beef which is gonna start sabotages and et cetera, et cetera. yeah and he doesn't have time for that uh, yeah i can see why he yeah. gets distracted yeah. with all the stuff going on yeah. for sure and that would <clears throat> exacerbate things so still, being Asmodeus' only true rival, Mephistopheles has much in his arsenal for the other Archdukes to fear. Uh, entire companies of Horned Devils and Ice Devils wait at his beck and call. In fact, despite recent times, the Ice Devils are bound to serve Mephistopheles before any other Archdevil, similar, similarly to Asmodeus' Pit Fiends or Levistus' Amnizu. So Ice Devils are extremely powerful. Like, uh, they're second only to the Pit Fiends. And okay. um, uh, what's, uh, Mephistopheles has all of them. Like all of them. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, there might be some in Levistus's camp, but like for the most part, Mephistopheles has all of them. And that's a big deal because uh, all the other Arch Devils are stuck with lesser devils and pit fiends that are basically Asmodeus's like lend outs. So big deal. Okay. The Cold Lord has also made a relatively new and powerful ally, the ancient red dragon Tesseron, who was bribed to come from the material plane to Mephistopheles' domain with the job of lounging around the th- th- throne room hall and making it look more foreboding. 
Sure. But yeah, I mean, an ancient <laughs> dragon is a big it. deal. Yeah. A red dragon. But yeah. like, why would a red dragon go to a cold place like this? He got bribed. Yeah, enough, I guess so. Enough gold. We'll do no it. I wonder his shit is fucking melting everywhere. Yeah, but he doesn't care. That's the thing is he doesn't actually care about the cold. It just happens to be cold here. So he doesn't <laughs> give a fuck if he terraforms the place. Right on. He's like, you're uh, just like sit on some hellfire, homie. Yeah, exactly. It'll be good. <laughs> uh, Mephistopheles also has children to help him do his bidding, such as his half fiend, half elf daughter, a- Antilia, who serves as his double agent against Beelzebub or the winged, mo- this is, I love this one, or the winged monolith of half, half fiendish fire known as the burning soul. <laughs> Made through Mep- M- Mephisto's union with a powerful resident of the plane of fire. Okay. So this sure. thing is half devil, half arch elemental. And it's a sentient fire called the Burning Soul. Yeah, it sounds like they just shoved their planar energies together. Yeah, basically. There was no coitus. No, probably probably not. But. Just some energy transfer. Yeah, it's just... Uh, what some, is a coitus but an energy transfer, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, let's go with that. Let's see how many more times I can say coitus this episode. Uh, the fiendish surgeons within his palace augmented a breed of hellhounds, the fearsome Nessian warhounds, that even... Uh, with even greater abilities, uh, making uh, Mephistopheles' pit hounds even stronger, bigger, crueler, and fierier than Asmodeus's. Okay. And I bet you he talks about it all the time. <laughs> My dog's better than your dog. <laughs> My dog is stronger. Yeah. It it burns more. It's meaner. It's bigger. It fetch good. Your dog don't fetch good. Yeah. <laughs> My dog fetch good. <laughs> Perhaps Mephistopheles is the most powerful and dangerous allies, though, are the pit fiend aristocrats of Cania, who, along with many of the horn devils, dwell in the rocky spires and pits of its borderlands. There are two companies of pit fiend nobility, each consisting of 33 individuals of equal rank, most of which are barely loyal to Mephistopheles and are possibly his greatest weakness. Oh. Um, one might wonder, given the untrustworthiness of his pit fiends, how Mephistopheles is able to retain control over his domain much less devote all of his time to research. Uh, this is thanks to his chief servant, the extremely powerful fi- pit fiend, Hutigen, or Hutigen, um, said to be one of Hell's greatest dukes and perhaps the quintessential duke. He is responsible for guiding Candy as pit fiend nobles. So remember I was telling you, pit fiends are super not loyal to their arch devils. They're only super loyal to Asmodeus. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously they, they work for the arch devils. Um, but they're also always trying to undermine the arch devils because they know if an arch devil fucks up, they could take advantage to to get that promotion. Right? Yeah, they could become the, yeah. the archduke. So, so Hutigen is Hutigen is is the medium that yes. Kind of- so Hutigen is, if not the strongest of all pit fiends, amongst like the top three of all pit fiends. Okay, he's just shy of just being a duke himself. I mean, he basically is a duke. Um, but he's super loyal. We're going to get into this in a second. He's super loyal to Mephistopheles, and he's able to keep these 66 pit fiends under control. Okay. And because he's got six, because he's got 66 pit fiends, which is way more than anyone besides Asmodeus, it's just another reason why no one wants to fuck with Mephistopheles. Okay, cool. That's a fun joke if you're like, Hutagen is worth 600 pit fiends, so there's really like 666 pit fiends. Yeah, see, I like that. Yeah. That's cool. So without him, Mephistopheles' domain would soon break out in open civil war, which if combined with outside interference against the weakened Cold Lord, would certainly spell Mephistopheles' end. Uh, yet despite having the power to challenge his master, Hutagen is famously unwavering in his loyalty, uh, treating Mephistopheles as a near god. Some theorize the Cold Lord has something over Hutigen, yet he never abuses the Pit Fiend's trust, uh, the stability of his domain without him likely playing a big part in that decision. So there's respect here, it yes, sounds like. there seems to be some mutual respect. Hutigen and believes the hype. He believes, in, he, he's bought into the hype, for ah, sure. Nice. Yes. There so, are people like that in the other planes, right? Like other oh, yeah. beings. Yeah, yeah, and there's, there's other... Beings like this in other planes of hell for other arch devils. Like, right. Yes. There's some di- ride or die motherfuckers. So. Yeah. Mephistopheles' other dukes are not to be underestimated either, such as his consort, his consort Balfagor, a skilled, charming diplomat, capable tactician, and able inventor, whose great value plays some part in Esmodius' toleration of Mephistopheles. And probably it's a consort, so they take part in the coitus. <laughs> they do. They do. So I couldn't find any clear answers, but this whole Balfagor thing seems to be a major reason why Asmodeus tolerates Mephistopheles. So I'm, what I don't know what her relationship to Asmodeus is, but it seems like is she like his his cousin or something? I don't know. But I like him being married or her being married to Mephistopheles means something to Asmo, so he he tolerates 
Mephistopheles. So it's, I'm getting some ex-girlfriend vibes here. Maybe. Could be. You never know. The Cold Lord once captured the blood and tears of Balfagor in a vial to create a powerful artifact known as, known as Balfagor's Grace, allowing the user to summon a group of Aranese known as the Blessed Angels that were ultimately loyal to him. That's when Asmo and her broke up. He caught the tears in the <laughs> maybe, jar. Maybe. Could be. Like, you come live here, but baby. now, like, so he, the dude has 66 pit fiends. He's got all the ice devils. And now he's got a, a whole squad of Aranese, like the third most powerful type of devil. Like, he's 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 militarily stacked. He's banging Asmo's ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Possibly. Way to go. Unclear. There is uh, <laughs> there is a cold duke known as Bifrons, another commander known for his great physical strength, apparent vigilance and loyalty and philosophical outlook. There is the untrusting and high-handed uh, Andonides, the young-looking yeah. steward and administrator of Cania, who roams the plane with 16 companies of ice devils looking for intruders and traitors. Oh, wow. <laughs> patrol squad. Yeah, yeah. There is the arrogant and unscrupulous Chamberlain Barbas, a lazy, fat, and gross treasure keeper whose dishonesty and greed is tolerated due to his brilliant deceptions in the name of security. Mm. Barbas must be kept in check not only by the wrathful scrutiny of Mephistopheles himself, but also by his, his, the other dukes as well. Among the archdevils, Mephistopheles isn't looked upon with particular favor. But let's be honest, who is? Like, none no, of them like each other. they all fucking other. hate each other. Yeah, yeah. The result of his blatant arrogance and unstable personality. Uh, his greatest and most obvious rival is Beelzebub, each regarding the other with bitter hate and seeing one another as their biggest obstacle to taking the throne of hell. Although their hatred does have other roots. Uh, like Despater, the archduke, the ancient archduke of Cania sees Beelzebub's rapid promotion as worthy of enmity. While Beelzebul has come to see everyone else as responsible for his transformation into a slug, especially <laughs> Mephistopheles. Each, funny. yeah, each conspire against each other. The hatching of plans taking up a great amount of their of time and their more open antagonism towards each other, being yet another part of the reason Asmodeus leaves them in charge. He's like, you know what? This is good. I like this. <laughs> the vibes are right. Yeah. The vibes are correct. You mm -hmm. guys all fucking plague each other just enough. Yeah. Yeah. Also on the cold, lo cold Lord's mental radar is the frozen prince, Levistus, who he carefully keeps an eye on. One of Levistus's agents, the half-fiend Xanth, has a taste for good-aligned children. And so Mephistopheles sends minor devils to offer the rare delicacy, subtly influencing his decisions. So yeah, Mephistopheles, again, these aren't good guys. They kidnap children from the material plane and eat them. So, Isn't Xanth the name of the bad guy in Twilight Princess? It is. <laughs> he's like a half demon. Yeah, or and a devil or whatever. Yeah, sure. Well, no, he's actually just a guy from uh, the, uh, the, the Twilight from realm. the yeah, yeah, like yeah, he was just some dude, right? Yeah, I don't know. There's he like, found the mask. I don't want to draw too many parallels. Okay, let's move on. I don't really know enough about it. Then there is. Uh, Belial, an ally of Beelzebul and his daughter Fierna, who, if Be Belial came to Beelzebul's aid, Mephistopheles would try to use against her father, uh, use her against her father, ideally as an ally or at worst a hostage. So that doesn't get um, elaborated on. Oh. It just Mephistopheles has a plan. If Belial comes to Beelzebul aid, there's something about Fierna that either he has on her. To use her as an ally, or he'll just take her hostage. Maybe he caught her tears too. Maybe he's it, like hanging it, out. I, for I didn't to break find bad. anything else, but it was that was stated. So, okay. among Mephistopheles' actual allies is the Iron Duke Despater, the two of which share, share seniority and a desire for knowledge. Despater is drawn to Mephistopheles' power and respects him as a true member of Devil Kind, unlike the relative upstart Beelzebul, who, although recently. Uh, Despater has tried to present himself as a friend to all and enemy to none, distancing himself from allies and trying to make peace with rivals in a futile attempt to ease his paranoia. So Yeah, that's not going to pan yeah, it's out. It's not going to pan out for Despater, and it's bad news for Mephistopheles because he's like, dude, you were my bro. What happened? Yeah, I, d I, like, the, um, I like the science buddy aspect yeah, of that, though. Yeah. You got to have some friends in hell. Right. Yeah. So on top of that, Mephistopheles' court has to be on constant alert for Despater's agents <laughs> as the secret loving archdevil is pained by the idea that Mephistopheles knows something that he does not. He definitely does, too. Yeah, he definitely does. Once the two of them were allies with the greedy Maman, but uh, the speed with which the spineless serpent sold them out at the end of the reckoning marked him as undesirable to all archdevils. Yeah, sounds like Maman. Yeah. I hate Maman. <laughs> Now that we're here, I hate Maman. Oh yeah, lot. he sucks. I, for me, I hate Beelzebub the most. I don't like him. He sucks. Uh, Maman is second. I don't like him. He sucks. Yeah, Beelzebub's. That's a slug thing, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. slug guy. He, he's got he, a palace he, he of does poop. Suck. He's got a palace of poop. I he, can't get on board. He's got a poop palace. I don't know. There's something about Maman that is like <laughs> from the roots. Uh, yeah. It's just so, he sucks. so yeah. awful. And he's weak. 
Yeah, and yeah. he's one of the weaker ones, yeah. Perhaps Mephistopheles' strangest relationship is is with his master Asmodeus, for he is the prince of evil's most dangerous en- enemy and most capable ally. Mm-hmm. Despite Mephistopheles making it abundantly clear that he dreams of the day that he can depose his lord, Asmodeus still seems to trust his counsel when offered. The relationship is further clouded by the existence of Glazia, to whom Mephistopheles is something of a godfather to. So now we have Dr. Doom Rue Richards vibes of yeah. like... They both are father figures to the the same the same daughter, right? Mm-hmm. Even though they hate each other. Um, several reasons behind this relationship between Asmodeus and Mephistopheles have been presented, but a more simple and underlying possibility is most likely. Mephistopheles is potentially the only individual archdevil that Asmodeus fears. His mastery of hellfire, knowledge of ancient secrets, and duty as guard of his realm make him a deadly and great enough asset to tolerate his threats. Though Mephisto cannot yet oppose Asmodeus, both watch to see if circumstance change uh, the nature of the situation. The lord of hellfire waiting until his adversary makes a big enough miscalculation for him to make his move. Mephistopheles is in something of an irritating situation when it comes to his cults. Uh, as despite being second only to Asmodeus in raw power, he has one of, if not the smallest cults out of all the other archdevils. Mephistopheles has been so effective in making himself the image of the devil that he has become generic in the eyes of many mortals. Uh, frequently <laughs> frequently confused with and believed to be Asmodeus. Uh, not only that, but further blurring any sense of identity is his symbol, or rather symbols, since he constantly adopts new icons to present himself. As someone who adores worship as a god, uh, this mistaken identity is frustrating to no end. Mm. That's uh, that's kind of funny. Yeah. I, I like it. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Still, even before his recent discoveries, Mephistopheles has some distinct brand of corruption, existing as a patron of magic and the source of many warlock pacts. He has the advantage of having the lowest quotas of the archdevils, but with the limitation of the highest standards. Uh, he and his harvesters specialize in luring skilled wizards and cunning sages into making deals by playing on their curiosity and ambition. The offer of magical might by itself often seen as proof of that mortal's greatness. Most of these types of cultists also seek to crush their rivals with said magical power and gain the ability to deflect and absorb magic through the deal. He has the most exclusive club. He does. And that's yes. good. And he that wants, is good. You want yeah. to maintain some exclusivity. So he, he has high quality souls, but doesn't have to have a huge quota of them. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's that's crazy. So they're like, are you Satan? He's like, basically. Yeah, basically. I might as well be. I should be. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So while skilled, the mortals being lured to Mephistopheles' traps are targeted due to gullibility or ego. And while the arrangement offer... Uh, offers them magic it also ensures the misery Uh, mephistopheles facade of charm only needs to last until the aspiring caster signs away their soul and after death they will face decades of tedious routine deep regret and isolation to prevent dissent Uh, the agents of mephistopheles carefully avoid statements about their lord's behavior and actions and the clever clauses in the signed soul contracts allow him to destroy the trick sages with a word sometimes entire wizard guilds and sage conclaves fall under mephistopheles sway as do magic using beings like storm giants or oni so after you collect the soul you have to age it like wine or whiskey or something and like yeah, keep it I think in a that's, barrel by itself yeah that's the to get the the rebellion out of them yeah. So that they'll be more useful to get the rebellion out. Let those uh, slight undertones of vanilla set in to the soul. <laughs> Absolutely. You ta- you're going to taste those notes. Uh-huh. Mephistopheles' recent insights into Hellfire have given him a new way to appeal to mortals. Even despite the fact that its diabolical nature typically requires the sacrifice of the user's own vitality to be called upon. The beauty of offering Hellfire lies in, in its accessibility. Most types of magic require the user to slowly refine their skills and or progress along a path of understanding how to use it. Mephistopheles' cultists can offer the dark energy to even the most inept persons of influence, granting them an easy, painless path to power, prestige, and dominion. Mm. Like, anyone can use it, man, because you're getting it through me. Right, yeah. yeah. The Lord of Hellfire offers magical power at unrivaled speed. Even a favored initiate of incredibly low ability can gain access to power, surpassing that of many co- accomplished magic users. Disciples of Mephistopheles are known as Hellfire Masters and Hellfire Stewards. Now, there's no mechanical implication to being a warlock of Mephistopheles, right? Like- no. Um, this is mostly a thing that you see in, like, like enemy stat blocks uh, and or, like, books. Like, like, actual novels. Man, what kind of character arc do you need to have to, like make good on a pact with Mephistopheles, you know, like, are you, well, make you good means like when you die, your soul's mine. So like, yeah, but there's no way get, out of that. Are you get, like, 
this could be a fun thing, like extra special stuff that you can. You yeah, can do yeah. In oh, game. there's a lot that you could do with this yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, and and like if if I had a character that like okay, I'm an infernal pact warlock, but I want to do a Mephistopheles thing with the Hellfire, I'd like we would do some homebrew. We would do some changing and tweaking of stuff to make it more Hellfiery. Yeah, I think this next part you're going to read is going to be telling about some of the stuff that, like, what kind of character yeah. you're going to have to be to, you know, yep. roll with Mephisto. Oh, oh, take a happened. shot. That's, uh, God hey, Dungeon it. Cast listeners, if you're new <laughs> to this game, it. when Will's phone goes off during a recording <coughs> session, we all take a drink. God Here, damn I'm going to do it right Me now. Me too. <sighs> Refreshing. Initiation into Mephistopheles' cult first requires a show of cruelty. The sacrifice of an intelligent being in magical flame, typically while the victim is alive, so as so as to provide a screaming chorus to silent prayers. Temples to Mephistopheles are strange, hidden, distant places, often filled with great fire pits in which to conduct a sacrifice, rigged to suddenly flare at the appropriate times, and on top of which were are slabs of blackened stone to serve as altars for the ritual. Oh, that's fucking cool. You have to go to like a tundra area mm -hmm. and like dig beneath the ice in yeah. a glacier and then you get inside this like temple you break it open mm -hmm. and it's fucking hot in here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh that's yeah, awesome absolutely a potential aid in this process is the book of brimstone a tomb or tome written in infernal by a Mef by Mephist a mephistopheles worshiping monk who shortly after writing it went mad and lost and was lost in the canian wastes it is rumored that only four copies of the book exist the first half consisting of the proper ways to worship adore sacrifice and become a disciple of mephistopheles amongst among other rites and the latter a small collection of vile arcane spells <clears throat> That'd be a cool item to find, I suppose. Uh, when you say when you say monk in this scenario, you mean like a religious monk and not like a flurry of blows. Uh, yes, monk. like a religious monk. Yes. Although the, like that, I, that's a weird line that Dungeons Dragons seems to walk, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it says it's because the term monk has been applied to two very different concepts in yes. real life. Yeah. So yeah, <clears throat> apart from those looking for easy power. Mephistopheles promoted himself as a god, promotes himself as a god of hellfire to those who revere flame, as well as devil worshippers that have become dissatisfied with their current archdevil patrons. Fire giants are known for their attempts to become hellfire masters. Oh shit, so mm -hmm. fire giants know about the hellfire. Yeah, and some of them are into it. Some <clears throat> of them like that shit. Mm -hmm. That shit burns good. Okay, so it's time to talk about Molokrath. Okay. <laughs> One of Mephistopheles' most infamous schemes was before the Reckoning. Uh, it was when he donned a secret identity as the Archdevil Baron Molokroth. He, quote-unquote, deposed himself using his alter ego and ruled for a great amount of time before finally revealing his true identity. Mm. The traitors who co-conspired with Molokroth to overthrow Mephistopheles were ended along with the deception. <clears throat> so it was a big cleaning of house. Nice. It was like, there's just too much backstabbing going on. I'm going to fucking overthrow myself and then kill everyone who helped me. <laughs> and that's what he did. <laughs> that's so good. Yeah, it's great. That's so good. It's very good. Okay. Uh, when donning the mask of Molokroth, Mephistopheles was a being without mercy that reportedly harbored great hatred for his Modius. While an archdevil being cruel wasn't exactly unusual, Molokroth stood out by the sheer extent to which he took his sadism, crushing most visitors between glaciers for years as a form of entertainment and utilizing the powers of cold in such agonizing ways that even godly agents would want to beg for mercy. He rarely left his citadel, both out of a preference for victims to come to him and out of a complete interest in activity and direct governments as well as vigilant protection of his territory, which is drastically different from his normal form, right? Normal form, he lets it govern himself because he's busy doing science experiments. <laughs> but basically, the way I imagine it is things got so out of hand that his hyper-focus became on govern governing instead of all the other stuff. Everything, everyone in hell is so fucking edgy, man. Yeah, yeah. All right. Definitely. <laughs> as one would imagine, Mephistopheles as an archduke is extremely powerful in his own right. His power on the level of demigods. He is a being impervious to the cold, not just due to having ruthlessly exposed himself to Canny's coldest temperatures, but because of his unrivaled mastery of hellfire. Yeah, man. That's some real, um, <clears throat> like, I'm getting Azula vibes yeah um, sure I, I like that yeah and i've waited so long so long in the episode to say it out loud but i'm oh, okay. thinking about it the whole time yeah yeah she's even got like the blue fire mm -hmm, like the extra mm -hmm. hot fire yeah. and all this shit yep, yeah yeah cool exactly mephistopheles is a deep study of wizardry specializing in evocation magic modified to 
taint his foes with foulest evil, has given him the powers of an archmage as well, and he is ready to loose a barrage of offensive magical destruction, the likes of which few could hope to survive at any time. Oh, God. Aside from his spellcasting, Mephistopheles also has many spell-like abilities to choose from. Showcasing his mastery of both elements, he has a number of both cold and fire abilities, such as Kona Cold, Fireball, Wall of Ice, or Fire, or Meteor Swarm, um, all without expending spell slots. Uh, he is also capable of inducing fear either through an aura or via his gaze. Mm-hmm. Mephistopheles' favored weapon is a three-tined military fork, or Ransur. Uh, he is known to have different types, such as one that can switch between inflicting fire, cold, and lightning damage. Another switches between burning eternally and being covered in frost and allowing the wielder to focus hellfire spells to be more devastating than normal. <laughs> okay. Aside from that and other magical items... Uh, the laboratories in his home citadel are filled with spell books containing nearly every known arcane spell, allowing him to prepare almost any that he pleases. Hell yeah, dude. This guy's fucking radical. Yeah, he's legit. Papa any Stoff. questions about Mephistopheles? Or uh, Papa Stoffa, as you called him before. <laughs> Papa Stoffa. I think this is one of the more interesting uh, devil, arch yeah. devils to take a warlock pack from, for sure. I was thinking a lot about that. Yeah. Some cool stuff, for sure. Yeah, he's and he's one of the only actual rivals that Asmodeus has, besides... Uh, Glazia, which would be you know his right. daughter, yes. but like when when you talk about Glazia and her lore, it's like she's still kind of at the beginning of her like ascent to yeah, power, she's right? New, she's like new she's here. newer, like she's basically that person that you know is going to hit the level of Meph- Meph- Mephistopheles and Asma, but she's not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, so in one D and D, when they start writing devil lore, yeah, maybe, maybe she'll, she'll be, be there. more powerful. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you ever think? Uh, speaking on that, do you ever think they're just like? Start fresh. You know how they like to start fresh from like 4E to 5E, I guess? 4E was their attempt of being like, let's do a, uh, what do you call those, a reboot? Uh, yeah. It's That's a, what 4E it's was. It's a reboot, but like they don't really take the time to write new characters, it seems. 4E did actually a lot. Oh, that's cool. They, okay. And then and the problem is most of them won't ever get their own episode because like they were they were like the well, the Raven Queen's a great example. Brand new character. Four E made her up and she was hugely popular. So they brought her over to Five E, but the th- problem with Five E was we're going back to the old lore. Where do we fit her in? And the way they did it, I didn't I didn't like, and I think a lot of people didn't like. Yeah, I think I think you could have easily. Like, look what they did with Tasha. Yeah. Like well, we just we just did our you, Tasha episode. You, and you like, also have to remember too, um, the, that first five years of 5e was Forgotten Realms and only Forgotten Realms. We don't even talk about other settings. I know. That and seems now, like a misstep, and huh? I think it was a great step at the time that had long-term uh, repercussions that are that have been happening for a while now. I see. So, yeah. so it was good to kind of make everything <clears throat> finite and mm-hmm. put it in the box of Forgotten yeah. Realms. And was, Forgotten Realms is good. I yeah, like yeah, it. Yeah. It's just like... So much more expansive than mm-hmm. that, and, you know? and and now they've just been slowly moving away from that to to the point where it's like I think a lot of people have forgotten that hey this was like everything was forgotten realms yeah. based. It's and hard now to it carry isn't. all this baggage yeah. and like write a good like because the more we talk about these characters, the more it seems like they these, this is a comic book style mm-hmm. approach where they're they have to rewrite this character mm-hmm. again mm-hmm. Yep. and and try to keep the continuity as something that is good. For, Something that people can keep track of. You got to keep track of it. Yeah. And old players have to respect it. And new players have to be into it, too. Yeah. And it can't be weird. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where they misstepped, mis- took a misstep with the Raven Queen was they they went in a new direction. It just didn't work out. And like yeah. people that don't know the old Raven Queen lore might like the new Raven Queen, Queen lore and then stumble across the old lore and be like, yeah. wait, what the fuck? But I, I can also tell you from like someone who was around during 4E is like, the Raven Queen's popularity was massive in 4e like she was one of the, the most popular things in D at the time yeah and people were excited her for her when she rolled over 5e and since she's rolled over to 5e the amount of her popularity and the amount of people i've seen people talk about her has plummeted off a fucking cliff yeah well their critical role was doing their thing with the raven queen which yeah was very and that cool. and but that was all 4e based. that has done that yeah. has been done though yeah. for a while like yeah. they, they ended that arc yeah. So so that's the thing is like I'm sure there are plenty of new players that don't know the old 4E stuff that are fine with her lore, mm-hmm. but it's not like before where everyone was in love with her lore. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Anyways. I would say the Raven Queen lore is like worse than it was, but not like the, the worst lore. Like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine, but it's also it transforms her into an entity I thought was super cool and badass to someone I'm like, oh, you're kind of weird and gross. You're kind of weird and gross. Yeah. And a little boring. And a little boring. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, that's more like. You know, comparison bias, I think, too. Yeah. 
Oh, cool. Mephistopheles is wicked awesome. Yeah, um, he's super cool. That's a, it's fun that's to mess cool, with. That's yeah. our last Archdevil. We did it. Yeah, we covered we did them it. all. All Archdevils have been covered. Hell yeah. Uh, most of the major demon lords have been covered. Um, but there's still more fiendish stuff to come for this next month and a half we got left. That's right. So, yeah. Happy holidays, everybody. Indeed. It's coming. Um, Indeed. So where are we in the, in the time? All right, we got to get away from timeline stuff. Yeah, we don't talk about timelines we're not, anymore. We're going to stop talking about timeline stuff because it gets messy when we record. But we're about to go into the long rest where we do talk about timeline <laughs> stuff. So let's get ready for the long rest. All right. Shout out to everybody welcome to the long rest this is the part of the show where we say thank you thank you for listening to the show thank and you. for being a part of this fiendish ride indeed it's, it's been a cool it's been a cool year year of the fiend has been awesome um when do we want to announce the next year yeah. when do we want to announce the next year should we wait i know we'll do it on the final fiend episode of the year the last fiend episode we'll do it we'll do a handoff yeah. a baton indeed. style handoff indeed to the next thing a baton ah, that's a clue <laughs> a handoff I mean that's uh, kind of that's that's such a uh, it's uh, pretty that's a it's, reach yeah it's a pretty it's a pretty far stretch yeah but but yeah, yes though we'll also still yes. yes yes indeed uh, considering some of the artwork that we have in the pipeline yes yeah I, I knew what you meant I got it <laughs> I know that you know but do you know listener uh, yeah, I yeah I dare people to guess they'll never get it yeah guess I dare you they'll never get it um okay so we're not gonna talk, we're not gonna talk about what next year's yeah. topic is but we're we're very excited for it as we were for each topic. Mm-hmm, so it'll mm-hmm. be good. Um, we have uh, patreon.com slash the dungeon cast is where you can go to support us. It's where you can go vote on episode topics. If you're interested yes. in, in like pushing your opinion forward mm-hmm. and uh, pushing for it, uh, like I think we're going to shoot for once a month. Um, yes, it'll be once a month where we'll be doing Patreon voted episodes. Every month we have the vote going on. Mm-hmm. The November vote, which is for the December episode, um, it's just about to close out and last i checked dragon lance was in the lead so it, it's looking like a dragon lance episode okay um and next month starting on december 1st i'll i will start the vote for january patreon episode yeah uh so check it out uh we'll do some newsletters there yes yeah, so we got a weekly out. newsletter weekly newsletters and um the early episodes have been uh like all out of whack so sorry about that but they'll be back soon uh probably this week yeah um uh, we really, we would really appreciate it if you guys left us iTunes reviews. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those are awesome. Those are always they help, great. They yeah. help the show a lot. Um, so if you're listening to the show, if you've been a long time listener of the show and you like the show, go leave a review. Uh, it doesn't yeah, have please. to be on iTunes. It just it, that that's helpful. Anywhere you're watching or yeah. listening, um, watch uh, or hit the like, subscribe if you're on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, those those reviews they help a lot and they make us feel good. Indeed, indeed. And that and just you know tell a friend, share it with your with whoever you play D and D with. Like share the show with them. They might enjoy the show. Yeah, um, we we called we called you all out in Chicago, um, as we saw <laughs> Chicago. Here. But like that goes for everybody, like in especially in the big cities where we have a lot of of uh, people clustered together listening to the show. Like, yeah, uh, you know, Los Angeles, New York, like those are all those are all big ones. And then Canada, we've got a lot of Canadian listeners. So yeah. thank thank yeah. you guys too. And you know what? It does it doesn't even have to be a big city. Hey, Kansas. Hey, Kansas. Go share it with a friend. Is there we love you, Kansas. Kansas. I bet you there's got to be at least five people in Kansas. There's probably at least five people in Kansas. If we, you're we can, in Kansas look. and you're listening, leave a comment or a review, please. <laughs> please I yeah. want to hear about you. Uh, or tell somebody about tell t- oh, I mean, do uh, that tell too. somebody about the show. Yeah, tell, absolutely. Tell your friends. Let's get Oklahoma uh, City on the map. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what I've noticed is a lot of content creators like our show a lot because it helps them become better dungeon masters. Yeah. So are we the content creators? Content creators? I think is that who we, we might are? be. <laughs> That's what I've been told by other content creators. That's I've like, been told the same thing. Hey, I listened yeah. to your show to get like yeah. prepped. Absolutely. Like, yeah, sick, man. That's fucking awesome. We <laughs> love you. Cool. Indeed. Please do. Um, so yeah, if you guys are uh if you guys need a dungeon master, put them on to the show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh it helped me become a, a dungeon master. Yeah. If you're interested in becoming a dungeon master or you know someone who is, share the show. Yeah, we need as many of you as will come out and yeah. do the fucking thing. Indeed. It's not the easiest thing, but it gets easier with practice. Mm-hmm. Much easier. Yeah. And it's not as hard as people think it is. Yeah. Also, it's a completely different type of fulfillment. Like, mm-hmm. being a player is a lot of fun. Being a dungeon master is really rewarding and fun in a totally different way. Yes. Um. So, I like doing both. I actually prefer DMing to playing, but I like 
I love doing both. Yeah, I think I think it's good. It's good to have both. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, iTunes reviews are specifically very good. But if you guys are listening to us on another platform, please don't hesitate uh, and re- review the show. It only takes a second. Stop what you're doing. That's what other people do, right? They tell people to stop right now. Stop right now and go review the fucking thing. Um, no, it really does. It really does help when you guys tell somebody about the show uh, and review the show. Reviewing the show is like a way of of promoting it pretty much. So like, that's why we, we push on that. Yeah. And then, um, uh, you can check us out on like social. You can t- check, although that's explode. Elon Musk is trying to take care of that for us. So we never have to do another Twitter <laughs> post again, but, um, you can check us out on Discord. Discord's a great place. You can come talk to us there. Yeah, I think Discord's like pretty much the number one of all the social medias out there. That's our best one. I would say I that's so. like my yeah. favorite one. Yeah, surely. definitely. And then, it, it's got just a crazy amount of activity. We're on there. Uh, so people yeah. people talk to us on there all the time. And it's just a great community that's yeah. all about D&D and, and the Dungeon Cast to a certain degree, but just D&D in general. Yeah, we, and, and we love taking feedback. So if you guys ever had feedback, you can send us an email at thedungeoncast at gmail.com or go to Discord and leave it there, wherever you guys want. We're, we're open to feedback always and whether or not we listen to it is up to us but thank you guys so much for listening to the show and we will catch you on the next one let's call it a game let's call it a game the dungeon cast